There we go. Um, hi, and welcome back to this afternoon of Haunted Machines and Wicked Problems, as you can see. I'm apparently Natalie Kane, curator of, uh, one of the curators of Impact Festival. Uh, Tobias is probably somewhere in the audience. Um, I kind of want, oh, there he is, he's right in the front. I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't see you. All in black. Um, but I'm going to keep things brief for intro. Um, the technological body is the title of this panel. Um, and it's something that we're in quite intrigued in the way that the, te the technology can augment or distort or change or manipulate the way that we often see our own bodies or whatever you kind of deem bodies to be. And I'm going to keep that definition relatively vague and potentially up for definition by our panellists, which would be interesting. So I'm going to, without any further ado, I'm going to welcome up our first uh, speaker to the stage, which is Sarah Kemba. Sarah is Professor of New, Media, uh, New Technology and Communications at Goldsmiths and founder of the Goldsmiths Press. Her most recent book is iMedia, which is on the gendering of objects, environments and smart materials and is currently in the process of writing not one, but three other books. So I'm sure she'll talk a bit more about later. But uh, I'll leave the stage to Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, so I thought I'd take a sort of broadly future of work approach to the question of the body and technology um, and argue provocatively, perhaps, that uh, far from bringing about the elimination of work through automation, technology um, in the home, especially, but also in the city and elsewhere in the workplace, um, technology has a, always had a tendency to multiply work for women. Uh, it's doing so now, I would suggest, is exactly as it did in the 1950s, exactly as it did in the 1950s, with that earlier generation of three C technologies, yeah, comfort, care, convenience, my, what's it? Um, so a dilemma or a paradox or something, women are still struggling to get work in tech, uh, so we're told a lot at the moment. I don't normally do statistics, but there we go, they're quite stark. Um, in the tech industries, in the tech part of the tech industries, under 20%, down slightly from 2009. And look at the figures for African American women and Hispanic women. Um, and then we know from social science research that if and when women do get work in tech, they're going to struggle to get equal pay and promotion and all the rest of it. At the same time, IT tech works women, how does it do that? Um, low pay, long hours, uh, again, consistently, tech, uh, technically, people are, uh, women are about twice as likely as men to be paid under seven pounds an hour. And I'm also gonna suggest that, that tech works women through gender forms of biopower. And what it means for me is that this task of reworking technology uh, is still quite an urgently feminist one. I used to be a cyber feminist, um, it was a while ago. I'm all right now. Um, the, the cyborg was, of course, a historic figure. It's past, <coughs> it's a Cold War figure. Uh, cyborg feminism, cyber, cyber feminism, probably, you know, a post-Cold War politics. So let's just say uh, we're techno-feminists now. Legacy and I did an event at the ICA a couple of years ago called techno-feminism. Now it was kind of fun, so I thought I'd stay with that. Um, and, and at the same time, I think a techno-feminist for me is someone who can handle the Kool-Aid. You know, you take a little and you stay standing. Um, and that's important. And I think, uh, unfortunately, uh, I, I still think that uh, kind of revamped uh, cyber or techno-feminism very much still needs gender political figures, ideas, images, metaphors to do their work in new contexts that come after A-Life, AMI, smart environments, machine learning, and so on and so on. Um, and that post-gender figures are, for me, still a little bit premature. And the reason I say that is because in these new contexts, what I'm seeing is sort of gender, race, class, sexuality, roles being hardened, if anything, restructured, reorganized, reasserted. Um, for, for gender particularly, uh, there's a lot of re-traditionalization um, going on and a kind of, you know, a normalization of, of certain identity roles in a wider culture that uh, increasingly seeks, as we know, to, to dismiss ultimately, to disarm, to dis disperse, but ultimately dismiss political movements like feminism on the following kind of basis. And I am talking about the alt-right. I am talking about its association with a kind of nerdy, tweeting, trolling kind of masculinism, um, saying that we uh, get things out of perspective, we have no sense of proportion, no sense of humour, because it's all just banter. 
uh, and we're all oppressed equally anyway, so that's fine. Um, and, and this is the one that really gets me, that um, as advocates for diversity, we discriminate against what, who, white dudes in precarious position of power. Um, and uh, there is a, a colleague of mine, Angela McRobbie, has been arguing for a while that there's this new sexual contract for women, which says uh, much, much more visibility for women, and, uh, and actually, paradoxically, a bit less voice in some ways. And I think the, the visibility thing is really important. It's what I've been talking about in iMedia. Um, and it seems to me that in environments of ubiquitous computing, young women especially are increasingly ubiquitous. They're hyper-visible. They're everywhere. And everywhere and everywhere. Everywhere, W-A-R-E being, kind of wrapped up in the technologies we use. Uh, everywhere in wearables, clearly. So, subject to scrutiny, subject to quantification, measurement, we know this, um, regulation and self-regulation, in things like this... Um, Smart bras are there to, they have sensors, right? So they're there to measure mood um, and, to, and to help us because, you know, they like to be helpful uh, by preventing stress-related overeating. So there we are, consider yourself helped. Um, chastity bras, you see what I mean about the re-traditionalization of gender roles. If you're young, you're supposed to be pure and innocent still, apparently. I wouldn't know. Uh, so pass me. Um, and these have sensors too. And um, obviously they're designed to kind of uh, stay locked until your uh, prince comes along and your heart rate reaches a level pseudo-scientifically associated with true love and pseudo-science is everywhere at the moment and then of course you get your um, you know carry on films yeah, yeah. okay um, so we have uh, we have beauty myths we have uh, we have we have beauty apps we have we have health apps we have these kind of seem to be very Victorian style uh, augmented reality enabled mirrors and glasses and screens that help us with our shopping because that's really what we want help with um, and give us lots of schedules and to do lists there are so many to do lists and they seem to all be for a particularly gendered us this is Corning's a day made of glass that's Jennifer Jennifer's in the bathroom she's got her pajamas on hasn't brushed her teeth yet and there's her schedule for the day. I'm sure she's thrilled. Um, there's agendas <laughs> everywhere. Um, this poor woman, this is Microsoft's productivity future vision. It has several iterations on YouTube, I believe. Anyway, she's just got off a plane. It's the middle of the night. She's probably a bit knackered and all the rest of it. And her augmented reality enabled taxi window uh, flags up a building and says, your meeting tomorrow is here. So uh, great. I'm sure that's what she wanted to hear too. Um, these are all Cinderella subjects for me. They're kind of emerging in and as their glass environments, uh, smart glass, glass slippers, if you like, uh, transforming into ever more perfect, ultimately ever more productive versions of ourselves, and we know exactly what happens if we complain about it. So I have a, a, a dilemma that I'm dealing with at the moment, which is that if work is problematic, if work for women is multiplying, then how do we fix that without working even harder? If you know the answer to that, would you please uh, 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 let me know? I, uh, I myself have been working on this novel that Natalie talked about for some time. Um, it's a satirical science fiction of, about uh, uh, gender and smart tech and work, and it's called A Day in the Life of Janet Smart. Uh, and I've written it alongside uh, writing these academic books and uh, admin and teaching and running a university press, and you know, you get the picture. Uh, and at the beginning of her day, uh, Janet Smart's pretty much... Uh, already exhausted, um, and this is my point. So um, I run a press, I write about publishing, is another thing I do now. Um, and what I'm arguing here, uh, and I think this is probably relevant to other contexts, is that you know, work needs to be re redirected in some ways, because this is the only way I can think of to solve the dilemma of work, is to redirect work away from the obligation to, in this case, publish or perish, uh, produce endless quantities of publishable output for audits, for CVs, for commercial publishers, for whatever. Um, instead of you know, carrying on doing this, kind of being incredibly productive, uh, redirect our efforts to uh, uh, querying this obligation and re-evaluating exactly what publishing is for, what scholarship is, who counts in it, what counts as it, that kind of thing. And I think in the context of work, it's something similar uh, to do with redirecting work uh, uh, to the work of re-evaluating the future of work as it is set out in current debates on automation, as it is set out in current debates on tech acceleration. And I actually think this work of re-evaluation and redirection is broadly feminist work. Um, I'm doing some work at the moment with uh, Caroline Bassett and Kate O'Riordan at Sussex on feminist media futures. And we're arguing uh, that the promise of automation really is one that seems to eliminate bodies and politics, labouring bodies and the politics of work, especially seeking to supersede one and transcend the other. The idea being 
that technology produces, as it were, by itself, magically, uh, worlds that just are, you know, unmediated almost worlds, worlds that will soon be, because there are always <coughs> future worlds. And in, in these worlds, all our problems will be solved. Yeah? So this is, for me, automation in the, and the discourse around automation at the moment is solutionism writ large. It is a kind of technocratic utopia. Uh, and it very much runs counter to our understandings, our con uh, theoretical understandings of what media and technology are and what they do, in a sense as not being uh, solutions to the social, but very much part of the problem, you know, completely embedded, enmeshed, producing, performing the social, uh, performing bodies and identities and relations and worlds and futures that therefore remain completely messy and problematic and contestable. And I really worry about the loss of contestability uh, um, and how that gets sidelined in these kind of tech solutionist approaches. Um, and we can see uh, around us, I think, in all the kind of current environments of, of smart media and smart tech uh, and machine learning, this kind of enmeshed relationship uh, between technological uh, and, and, and the social and the body at play. And one of the key ones at the moment, obviously, is face recognition. Uh, which I've done a fair bit of, uh, of work on. And, um, and what's interesting about it at the moment is that it's using physiognomy quite overtly, physiognomy being this kind of pseudoscience of the 19th century associated with scientific racism, associated with eugenics. Uh, and it's being used now to argue that uh, face recognition systems can, again, sort of somewhat uh, crazily and magically tell by your face the configuration of your features, how close your eyebrows are together or whatever, uh, whether you're gay or have any intention of being gay. Um, and, uh, uh, and indeed, whether you're, whether you're going to do something criminal, not just whether you are a criminal from a database, but whether you are actually thinking about being a criminal. Um, so this is amazing. And at the same time, um, we have gender estimation algorithms that are busy kind of reclassifying us and resorting us into these uh, very uh, tired categories based on biological difference, so that you can either be black or white, male or female, old or young, you can't be anything even a little bit in between. Um, this is the database for gender estimation. Um, and of course it delimits what you know, possibilities are, what a face can be, because you can only be identifiable if you already correspond, of course, to the rather uh, categorized and already standardized image of a face that constitutes the input for the, for the system, the database, the training set, what have you. Now, <clears throat> you know, of course there is um, a vital process at work here. In a sense, we are becoming mugshots. In a sense, we are co-evolving, our faces are co-evolving even with systems of face identification. There is a kind of negentropic process at play here, as Stigler would have it, um, in this kind of co-evolution of bodies and technologies. At the same time, uh, you know, we're being sifted, sorted, recategorized, re made hierarchical again uh, um, in, these sorts of, in these sorts of ways. Biological essentialism comes back in. Um, and the tech uh, industry itself, as well as its critics, are fully acknowledging in this context and in others that what's actually going on is that we're reinstituting historic forms of bias and discrimination. And so the question is, what do you do about it? Um, I did, and clearly there's techno feminist, intersectional techno feminist work still to be done here, and figures I would suggest to be deployed. I did a, a talk um, recently for the British Science Festival in association with Late Night Women's Hour. I have to emphasize that, that's the cool one. Okay, it's not the T and, you know. Um, the, the agenda was uh, um, women in tech and inclusion. And I was saying, of course, this is very, very important still and will continue to be, but we still need to think about how gender and technology fit together in media, in algorithms, in marketing, in tech design. We're getting health apps marketed to women that have no uh, content on women's health. And that's partly, of course, because they're only partly about that. And the rest is about optimization, self-care, bodily efficiency, leading a healthy and productive lifestyle. It's about individualizing healthcare in a, a cost-cutting, uh, uh, shrinking state environments. It's about perpetuating gender forms of power, which have always been oriented to the productivity and the reproductivity of women's bodies. And we know that science and technology step in here to correct for perceived failings, inadequacies, uh, so that, you know, uh, reproductive uh, medicine from, uh, well, the technology from, from, from IVF, say, to genetic engineering, uh, of course, it's beneficial in very many ways, and at the same time, it sort of sidelines women's bodies and kind of figures itself as a way of science, fathering, fathering itself, certainly in the narrative. And I think the same thing is going on with smart tech to a certain 
extent in the way that it's marketed, in the way that it's narrativized. It's as if smart tech was becoming its own smarter than you, uh, uh, more reliable, more hardworking, more flexible subject. And this kind of personification of technology is the flip side of the technologization of persons, you know, women as robots, I thought you were my friend, that kind of thing. And there are old stories in the history of technology. Personification, automation have been around for a long time. They're ongoing quests, they're very current. But for me, ultimately, the idea of full automation will remain a fantasy, a bit of a male fantasy, a projection of a very normative, humanistic sense of autonomy and omnipotence, even a bit of a god trick. Uh, I'm part of the Haraway fan club, obviously. Um, you know, a power play. And I think uh, that tech accelerationism as a kind of left project that embraces automation, that kind of bring it on approach to the end of capital, you know, let's, let's uh, push down the accelerator, let's see the end of work, let's bring in universal basic <laughs> incomes. This fails for the same sorts of reasons. It is a form of solutionism. It's certainly too deterministic. Um, and it glosses over massive social divisions, which of course are opening up underneath all forms of social progress. So it strikes me as really odd that we're talking about universal basic income at the moment when you know, uh, uh, gender pay gaps are widening, global pay gaps are obscene. Yeah? Why are we? It seems coincidental, right? Same with the end of work. End of work for who, exactly? And it, it sounds like a male fantasy to me if it fails to take account of the extent to which the new generation of 3C technologies multiplies work for women, now as it did in the past, putting Janet's now in their smart kitchens, and you know, Jennifer's in their smart homes, doing all the work they used to do, you know, cooking, cleaning, looking after the kids, and these very heteronormative environments, um, and also you know, having a career, and also uh, um, spending 17 hours a day in the gym, and uh, programming the home ambient intelligence system before we've brushed our teeth. So if that doesn't work, and I don't think it does, um, what, what do we do? Uh, intersectional inclusion is terribly important, but we can't just assume that's going to fix it because you know, how does it change the status quo? What kinds of futures does it create? If you don't put all the onus on women to get in to the industry, get on in the industry, and then fix its uh, structural problems, that doesn't work. Uh, so we have our hands-on, critical, creative approaches. For me, these have always been about parody, irony, satire, humour. They have always been about re-evaluating metrics and retelling the stories that the tech industry is telling us about what we look like uh, and what we can do and where we can go in the future. Um, and we should really, really hold on to, I think, the, the, the feminist genealogies that you know we don't talk about enough, and that's why I kind of bring up the idea of Cinderella subjects, um, you know, these feminist appropriations of fairy tales, of Cinderella, of Little Red Riding Hood, of Goldilocks, I think I've used recently, and the myths like Medusa, right? Um, for Ellen Sisu, the laugh of the Medusa, uh, radical feminist manifesto of the 1970s, obviously, the, the laugh is a bring the walls down type of a laugh. It's not a ha-ha kind of a laugh, right? It's utterly rebellious, and I think at the same time, it can be quite useful to use against reactionary forms of humour that are very prevalent, not least in the smart tech industry where we have things like smart bras. So we do have our um, established uh, academic and, uh, and artistic approaches to handling the, the problems that I think are pretty severe at the moment with, with tech, um, and especially the, the environments of smart media and smart technology. Um, and innovative ones, which I'm sure you're going to hear about. But I, I think there's a growing sense that you know, we need to do more, go further, work harder. And um, for me, this is something to do with asking you know, what it means to be in tech. What exactly is programming? What exactly, or who exactly is a programmer? That is, including but beyond the gendered uh, and ethnic aspects of identity, but to include attention to, and I think it's come up a little bit earlier on, education, knowledge-based discipline. Um, and the reason I'm saying that is that, you know, if we're going to contend with the extent to which data and algorithms encode historic forms of bias and discrimination, we must recognise that coding is social history. Right? Coding has to be feminism. Coding has to be anti-racism. And then we have a big, well, fine, but how we do that question. How do we do that? We have useless catch-all terms. Interdisciplinarity, multi, trans, I don't care. They don't do anything. They're just holdalls. Uh, we do not know how disparate knowledge practices intersect and how they operate, interoperate, if you like. Um, 
it's very much, it's, again, it's a very, very old question, of course, but it's also very, very current. So, you know, Donna Haraway is asking it, uh, um, Mackenzie Walker is asking it, um, and just to finish there on a, on a slight note of caution, because what I'm seeing also is a long-standing tendency to defer to science fiction. Now, I write it, I love it, I will continue to write satirical science fiction, partly, to be honest with you, I just don't know what else to do sometimes, uh, and because I do believe that laughter will eventually tear the walls down. Um, but, but, but science fiction is not the site of a new modern synthesis. It, it's, it's not a solutionism. It can't be solutionism, it shouldn't be. Uh, you know, neither art nor fiction are outside of the problems they engage, and at best they are forms of antagonism, and my point just to, to conclude is the work of antagonism has never been more important or more difficult uh, and that's because we have so much tech solutionism uh, creeping into theory as well. We have this uh, heinous political climate which uh, dispenses with politics as best it can. Uh, we have these kind of algorithmic forms of discrimination to contend with and we're already knackered. Right, thank you very much. Great. Um, up next we have Legacy, Russell, who's a writer, artist and cultural producer, born and raised in New York City's East Village. She's a UK gallery relations lead and gallery partner programs lead for the online platform Artsy. Her work can be found in a variety of publications worldwide, including BOM, The White Review, Rhizome, DIS, The Society Pages, Guernica, Bufferas, and much beyond, as you can imagine, she writes very prolifically. Um, she's holding an MRes of Visual Cultures with distinction from Goldsmith College. Um, her academic and creative work focuses on gender, performance, digital selfdom, idolatry, and new media ritual. Her first book, Glitch Feminism, is forthcoming and will be published by Verso, and I believe she's going to talk to you more about it today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Tonight, I'll be a lovely girl. I'm calling all the girls. We're gonna turn this party out. I know you want my body. I'll be a lovely girl. Calling all the girls. I see you look me up and down. And I get to party. So there are many ways to think about the body, this idea of the corporeal that has been expounded on so much across history. For the purpose of today, I want to ask all of you in this room to remain present with me. And just for a second, regardless of what comes to mind when you consider the word body, think about this idea of the body as being cosmic, as being inconceivably vast. So part of the definition of the archetype of the body as we know it, a social construct, a cultural tool, a political agent that I am drawing on when I think about glitch feminism is this notion of giving material form to something that is abstract. We use body to give material form to something that has no form. So what does it mean to ghost on the body? What is it asking of us to end our relationship with the social practice of the body as we know it? to let go of the material of the normative, gendered architecture of the body, to withdraw from it, and to manifest a new understanding of it that embraces a new reality. Glitch feminism calls for this. It asks us to look at the deeply flawed society we are all currently implicated by, 
participating within, to confront the violence that society has done to bodies who disidentify, to bodies who exist within the liminal, and embrace the in-between as a core component of survival. Glitch feminism embraces the causality of error. It turns the gloomy implication of glitch on its ear by acknowledging that an error in a social system that has already been disrupted by economic, racial, social, sexual, and cultural stratification and the imperialist wrecking ball of globalization, processes that continue to enact violence on all bodies, actually might not be an error at all, but rather an erratum, a correction. Glitch finds its roots in the Yiddish glitchin, and the Yiddish meaning slippery area, or perhaps German, um, which is to slip, to slide. It is this slip and slide that makes the glitch plausible, a sum in the liminal, a transformation across selfdoms. Glitch feminism calls for a breaking of the hegemony of a structured system infused with the pomp and circumstance of patriarchy, one that for all too long has marginalized bodies and within this has done so much violence to female identified bodies, continuing to offend our sensibilities by only giving us a piece of the pie. We're looking for something beyond a room of one's own. We're looking for the world. Glitch feminism looks to the digital as a means of building these worlds. It underscores that the binary code of male-female and the code of real life as posited by the language of IRL, pitted against the lives we lead online, somehow taken as less real, um, as being too rigid, not allowing for that slip and slide. The selves we occupy online at night on the internet are important. They are beautiful, they are meaningful. As such, we have to continue to experiment, bloom, and build. Artists, in particular, play a really important role in this experimentation. They act as a key bridge between what happens online and what happens AFK, away from keyboard. Artists such as E. Jane, Manuel Arturo Abro, Shawnee Michelaine Holloway, each of these ones are doing essential work here, creative architects finding ways to stretch this idea of the body to its limits. You know that feeling when you go into the club and start shaking your ass? And people start taking pics? Hi, my name is Manuel. Oh, maybe that's just and me. Today I'm going to talk show, a bit about that flash from the back. Accessibility on Facebook.com. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to welcome you to my garage. These artists want to return the body to the immaterial, to the cosmic, to celebrate its abstraction as actually a political tool. They create new constructs of the body online. Simone de Beauvoir is famous for positing that one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. The glitch posits one is not born, but rather becomes a body. Hi, I just want to know, do you people do it like this during the day, or is it strictly just at night? That you're, you're born naked and the rest is drag, you know? As <laughs> three-piece suits over there. I look terrible in a three-piece suit, but it's right. I mean, everything you wear, this this body you have is a vessel. Et voilà comment, environ 150 images plus loin, une autre jeune femme, sa semblable, sa sœur, qui est le même objet. Où est donc la vérité, de face ou de profil Et d'abord, un objet, qu'est-ce que c'est <laughs> well, what is your day like? My day, like, usually I go to sleep at, like, um, 7 in the morning. My day starts in the evening, so I have time enough to get something to eat, uh, go and um, take a shower, shave my whole body. <laughs> and then I um, tend to go out and have a, have a home cocktail, then put my makeup, and then go back out again. Peut-être qu'un objet est ce qui permet de relier, de passer d'un sujet à l'autre, donc de vivre en société, d'être ensemble. 
Mais alors, puisque la relation sociale est toujours ambiguë, puisque ma pensée divise autant qu'elle est née, puisque ma parole rapproche mon équipe de prime, et isole par sa qualité, puisque qu'un immense fossé sépare la certitude subjective que j'ai de moi-même et la vérité objective que je suis pour les autres, puisque je n'arrête pas de me trouver coupable alors que je me sens innocent, puisque chaque événement transforme ma vie quotidienne, puisque j'échoue sans cesse à communiquer, je veux dire à comprendre, à aimer, à me faire aimer, et que chaque échec me fait éprouver ma solitude, puisque... Just wondering for the people who don't make money um, promoting parties, um, if you got kicked out of your parents' house, what would you do? Now, yeah, Michael, what would you do? Guess you gotta find someone who's gonna pay away. Puisque je ne peux pas m'arracher à l'objectivité qui m'écrase, ni à la subjectivité qui m'exile, puisqu'il ne m'est pas permis ni de m'élever jusqu'à l'être, ni de tomber dans le néant, il faut que j'écoute, il faut que je regarde autour de moi plus que jamais, le monde, mon semblable, mon frère. So to conclude, um, thinking about this idea of cosmic bodies and what it means to ghost on the body, I think that most particularly we need to be thinking about how creative solutions can be put forward via technologies, how artists actually are part of that future imaginary and how the imagination is actually a viable activist and political tool in restructuring our current conceptions of the body and allowing us to be more cosmic. Thank you. And finally, we have uh, Simone C. Nikhil, who is a Swiss graphic designer and researcher. Her practice investigates representations of identity without a body, the digitization of biomass, and the increasingly omnipresent optic gaze of everyday objects. Simone is a 2016 fellow at the Het Nuer Institute and an educator at Artes in Arnhem. Thanks for having me. Um, I'll speak a little bit about the process that was involved in making a short film that was shown here at the premiere, The Fragility of Life. Um, and with that, that there's, it, it'll be a little bit of a back and forth between intentions, sort of process images and research that were involved in, in making this work. Um, so first of all, this, this work really started with trying to, um, what at that moment I call, um, look at the contents. And the contents for me were sort of a set of characters I created um, for me to, to sort of allow to do the research. They were sort of tools, um, sort of fictional uh, characters that, that would form the storyline um, of the film, but also to sort of help me and lead me through at the research that I wanted to do. Um, and the research was mainly looking at... Um, how capture technology um, functions, but also what the images that it uh, produces and the representations um, for whom and by whom, um, and who is actually looking at these images of bodies in that instance. Um, and so what we're looking at here is, for one, a character that I created for the film, which is called Critias Day, which is the one that's sort of creeping in on the side. Um, then there's also Teresa Barnwell laying under the Trojan horse, um, which is a um, Hillary Clinton lookalike that I visited who lives in um, Palm Desert in California. And she's sort of the main character carrying the movie. Um, I visited her around five days before the 45th presidential elections in the US last year. Um, and sort of trying to, to figure out how that event impacted her life, being sort of, you know, professionally as well as personally very much invested in the results of this um, election. And then uh, the, the third um, character is called Caesar. And this is the one that for me in the end, I, I did not know who this character was starting the research and was I think the biggest surprise. Um, and this is also not a character that I've, I've modeled. This is very much a found object. Um, and so as to uh, sort of progress, I'll, I'll uh, sort of unravel a little bit more how I came to find this um, character and why it actually fits into and links um, all of these three uh, characters together. 
so first, this is a, a film that um, I came across on, on YouTube. This is around um, 2009, 2010, um, Times Square in New York. Um, was closed down for cars and became a pedestrian area. And what happened as well is that the, the area was populated with, um, among other uh, things, also people that were wearing um, costumes that somehow related to sort of popular culture movies that were um, um, shown at the time. So there were a lot of Spider-Man, uh, SpongeBob SquarePants, but there were also a lot of Elmos. So there were like about five people dressed up as Elmos. The, the point of this was um, that they were offering tourists to take photos with themselves for like trying to receive a tip of a dollar or two to earn some extra money. Um, and what was incredibly interesting about this footage is that this um, person wearing the Elmo suit was arrested, sort of yelling racial slurs, slurs and anti-Semitic rants. Um, and what was so incredibly interesting is that then in the video you see the police walking up to this Elmo character, um, the character gets unmasked, and suddenly you have people sort of hearing, you hear them in the background sort of saying, oh my god, Elmo is getting arrested. Um, <laughs> And what I thought was so interesting for me is, I mean, it was so strange to see such imagery where you have such a completely different empathy towards the sort of the surface, the, the outside, um, being in this case the, the costume versus the inside, which is, you know, the sort of highly like racial dude yelling stuff that like, you know, anyone would hopefully disagree with. So, you know, the character in that instance that he was dressed up in almost acted as sort of this barrier. Um, to completely convert our empathy towards um, him being arrested, and also in some way completely um, cached his intentions, I believe. Um, and here's another footage that was also um, really important for me to, to come across. Um, I sort of really like to find stuff on YouTube accounts that you know, sort of have 70 views and less. Um, and this was similar, where I knew that during um, Narendra Modi's campaign in India in 2014, he was working with a company in London that was specializing on holograms. Um, and so his intentions with that was to try to give his campaign a completely different um, distribution value, so to speak. So um, what we're looking at here is the fields that a truck was set up to then project the hologram of Modi um, to give a speech, um, his sort of campaign speech. And this happened, um, I think, across 53 states within India at the same time. Um, so it was sort of a, a crazy... Um, you know, use of media to sort of project this real, sort of authentic image, which of course was just sort of pixels on a, you know, fog screen, um, to try to, to have a very different connection to the public that you were speaking to. Um, so also, I think resolution is really important in that. They sort of use 22K um, resolution projectors, which is in, like incredibly high resolution to, I guess, sort of, you know, try to achieve this sort of dazzling authenticity, sort of realer than real. Um, and also what we see is the stage was, was the plants um, and the couch were real, but then sort of the figure is what is uh, the hologram. So back to, to Critias Day, I mean, named after uh, the, the Roman statue Critias Boy, which is sort of at, at the moment of its creation is a new canon or ideal um, of beauty and a body and of youth. Um, and so how I came to create this was um, I was trying to find a, a sort of an easy way to create a 3D character. I'm like sort of well aware that you can also model this yourself, but I was intentionally interested in software that will make it attainable um, to create a character yourself, be this for gaming, be this for, you know, various sort of applications. Um, and so I've used a software called Fuse, um, which came to be called Fuse around 2015, was also subsequently bought by Adobe. And this is what makes it so interesting to me because essentially they want to include it into their creative cloud, so that their suit of um, creative softwares. And they also advertise it as something that you know makes it much easier to sort of um, create a character, pose it in the way you want it, and insert it into advertisements, slides, things like that, so without ever having to touch sort of a real person. Um, and so what we're looking at here is, is the skin, the texture that will be mapped over the, the 3D mesh. Um, and, and one side is the photographic texture and the other side is sort of me really crudely filling in um, the different body parts so that once you map it onto the body again, you see the sort of seams of here was the arm, here was the torso, and, and this is where the head is cut off. 
and there's sort of an inside view of what you'd get, this literally sort of hollow mesh. Um, and again, thinking back to Elmo, you know, for me it became almost a strange um, analogy where this is the Elmo. Um, within that you have an armature once it's, it's rigged, which means sort of um, points of the body are tried to be mapped to actual anatomy so that you could later on animate it in a way that seems believable. So almost, you know, the armature became sort of an analogy to a guy that was sort of in the instance of Elmo railing the, the racial slurs and, and the, the, the mesh was the encasing body. And why is this interesting? I mean, it was just the fact that you know, you could manipulate this in any way you like, and this is also, of course, its strength, but why do we need it to look realistic, and what is our sort of strive um, to to have this relate to a body? Um, again, sort of experimenting with what, what this skeleton inside looks like, sort of once you blow it up, you end up with this sort of strange, schlemmer-esque, like a triadic ballet, um, sort of figures, again, sort of these volumetric, um, geometric shapes encasing the body. Um, and here we're looking at the interface to, of the of the fuse um, character creator, and so what you get is first you um, select a head on the side, and there's four um, body parts that are called scans. So they don't ever say anywhere that these are scanned people, but I assume so by um, the quality of the texture and by the naming of the um, file size. So that at some point they scanned four subjects, um, sort of cut them apart like Frankenstein, um, for someone else to be um, able to reassemble them later. And so you also then um, essentially get a folder that you know contains a sort of object file and and the texture, etc. And um, so here, sort of a big chump, sort of me trying to figure out, you know, where does this come from to sort of strive for one authenticity, also realism. What is, the, again, sort of this manic accuracy to sort of talk about? Like, why do we, um, we, as in, I think it's a sort of a really Western um, um, sort of idea to try to measure, put um, numbers and data to the body to try to, you know, make it more efficient, make it more productive. Um, try to understand something that otherwise we don't. Um, and so two, I mean, again, it's a very crude history in 20 minutes, but um, um, two moments um, really stood out to me that are also incredibly linked to the advent of um, capture technology, so photography, um, that enabled a very different way of looking at a body. Um, and so one in the 18, um, 1900s was Etienne Jules Marais, who's a Frenchman, um, who built these crazy... Um, sort of outdoor cinema, basically. Um, within the, the sort of barrack space, you'd have a body perform wearing the suit um, on, on the other side of the slide, um, which almost looks like a motion capture suit you wear now, was basically a black suit with white stripes, um, performing in front of a, a black background. Um, the camera would go in a circle and then um, take multiple shots, which would produce a sort of skeleton-like um, capture of the movement of this body. And of course, this was also possible at this moment because photography was actually fast enough um, to be able to record multiple photos rather than sort of plate photography, you know, where you'd have to, um, have to take an incredible long amount of time to just take one picture. Um, this, along with um, Bertionnage, which was developed by a French policeman, um, Alphonse Bertion, um, who was interested in, in trying to identify repeat offenders, mainly. So, so trying to create a database um, to see who has been arrested, what are their, um, you know, sort of pseudoscience that um, was mentioned before. Also trying to figure out, you know, who is a criminal, what does a criminal look like? Um, and his experiment essentially in the end failed because he realized, you know, he has too much data. There's no way to sift through it because, you know, someone grows a beard, he sees him again 20 years later. It's actually incredibly difficult to know if he already possesses a photo of this person or not. Um, but the important thing is that, you know, what we see now is once we actually do have um, the capabilities to sort through such data, then um, experiments like these from the sort of 1900s come up again. Um, a big jump to, to 1930, 17. Um, these are experiments done by a couple called Frank and Lillian Gilbreth. 
um, what we see here was especially done for Ford, the motor company, where um, with the advent of the assembly line, the, the human body was part, sort of a cogwheel of the assembly line, but suddenly was the least inefficient part, um, or the one that was really hard to predict. You, you didn't quite know um, what kind of movement a, a human would do, whereas the assembly line just sort of treaded on. Um, so Ford commissioned Frank and Lillian to do these motion studies. So they, they would um, put a little light on the hand of the, the workers, um, have this grid installed behind them and take long exposure photos, so a photo for a few seconds. And that would allow them to trace the light and with that sort of trace the movement um, and, and really sort of figure out, you know, what, what kind of human, um, what kind of movement a human does. And if there's a little squiggle, then that is sort of lost time and time equals money as in, you know, let's standardize this movement and have everyone do the same one. And through that also know, um, I mean, render the body more efficient, but also be able to predict the time that, that production would take um, and, and make the whole process much more efficient. And so with this, we sort of slowly get back to that figure, that last figure, um, Caesar. So, you know, once again, sort of capture technology, in this case, 3D scanning, um, attained a very different um, power of looking, we, and anthropometry, so the measurement of the human body and translating that into, into um, numbers, didn't have to be manual anymore. Um, so for this particular um, survey, which was carried out by the US um, Air Force, as well as automotive partners and, and um, a few research institutes, um, they set out to scan the largest um, amount of subjects ever for a survey of body measurements, which was around um, like 2,400 bodies in the US and 2,000 bodies in um, Italy and the Netherlands. And these were also the sites that they, um, the, the three countries that they um, decided on based on the fact that the US would have the most diverse population, um, Italy would have the smallest, um, the shortest population, and the Netherlands the tallest of all of the NATO countries. And that would create a sort of an average of a, of a um, uh, measurement of, of a civilian um, that is part of a NATO country. And, and how I came, I always really like these links when something that, you know, is sort of highly questionable and I really want to challenge um, in sort of an academic way. You end up with such material um, where I knew the scanner that they de de developed for this program was called Cyberware. And I knew that they um, developed this actually for Star Trek to be able to make a face scan of, of um, Leonard Nimoy. But I really tried to find a photo of the scanner to try to understand... Um, you know, the mechanisms of this and, and how, like, you know, literally how you would enter it, what it would do, etc. Um, and while doing that, um, searching on YouTube, I found that other footage. Um, and essentially that ended up being by a guy that works for the National Institute of Standards that was part of this research and was able to send me the figure that we saw at the beginning. Um, this is, again, sort of Richard Nimoy getting scanned in, in uh, 1986. Um, and here, just to quickly go... Back, you know, for sure there was a 3D scanner involved, but at the end of the day, it also didn't advance that much. They also um, measured manually, which was really similar to um, the anthropometric measurements that were done by Bridgeo in 1880. Um, and this is sort of a, a very um, crude overview of the demographic that, um, the, you know, the way they made these decisions of, of, it's really practical at the end of the day, because there's only a certain amount of people you can scan. They had um, 60 minutes per person. So you can imagine the, the duration of time it takes to scan around 5,000 bodies and the data you need to, to actually store all of this and to sift through it. Um, but still, their intention was, of course, to create a standard and an average, so you would think it needs to be as diverse as possible. But through their documentation, you read a lot um, of their concern, but also of their struggles of actually achieving this. Um, and so the resulting um, body that I received was Caesar 0082, um, so possibly subject number 82. Um, and again, why this all connects to Teresa and Critias and, and all of that is that looking through um, the research that produced this FUSE program, um, 
this paper was essentially a thesis research paper um, from Stanford that um, in the end was turned into this startup called Fuse. And what I realized looking at this paper is that, you know, I kind of know this guy in the upper corner. And I realized this is actually the, the, the body that I've been sent um, by this researcher from the National Institute of Standards from the CSER research. So, I mean, this is, looks more or less linear now, but I think for me it was really much a puzzle of trying to figure out, you know, how was... Um, one software developed, and at the end of the day, you sort of end up with it with an army um, anthropometric study. Um, and why is because it is still um, one of the largest um, research databases that actually has such data of body measurements and, and 3D body meshes. So to create the software, what they had to do is to figure out what we um, see in this slide here is to try to segment, so try to figure out you know, that a software can um, recognize what is a hand, what is a, what is a head, torso, etc. Exactly the way that um, I would use the program to stitch together this, this person. Um, and so one way to do this was to create a learning database for the algorithm that is going to do this in the end. And um, Caesar, of course, was sort of a, a really good resource to try to create this database and in the end train this, this average um, um, way of, of looking at what a body is, of really recognizing this is a head, and if it's not, then it's, you know, sort of entering the uncanny valley. So this is the, the first paper, this is sort of a trail of paper you enter, you know, going back um, um, around 10 years, um, where the first body segmentation was actually done um, on Amazon Turk manually. Um, by people, um, you know, sort of drawing where the arms are, which then developed into a more computerized version. Um, so, I mean, you know, one thing that I'm that I'm just sort of trying to get at here is, you know, why are we trying to um, create uh, 3D figures that are, by the software that we use, sort of dependent on a standard way or, or a standard body. Um, even though a lot of the software, I think, tends to be not just in an industrial use, but also in entertainment, also in special effects, in movies, where it's actually encouraged to create fantasy, to create figures that, that would surpass what we call reality, um, because those, those softwares make this possible. But whenever it's used within other spaces, again, sort of forensics, um, journalism, where you know 3D animation is used as well, it sort of it has to um, submit to a completely different standard of accuracy and authenticity. And for me, somehow these two worlds really don't go together because as soon as you, um, like you see here, sort of you know only change the resolution of this 3D figure, you suddenly are in this again sort of uncanny valley where you think you know what am I looking at? This is kind of creepy. But at the end of the day, why is the one that's kind of falling apart more creepy than the one that's supposedly looking like a human being that also really isn't it's sort of this, um, you know, hollow mesh, which to me seems even more frightening. Um, so it's essentially really a questioning of, of, you know, to sort of embrace the other rather than try to recreate this constant image that we um, think we're supposed to be looking at. So thank you. I'm going to invite our speakers all on stage again. Thank you very much for a series of very brilliant and very thought-provoking kind of conversations. Um, I mean, well, I'm, I'm going to start with one question, and then I'm going to ask if any of you have any of questions for the others on the panel, and then I'm going to open it out to the audience. Does that sound okay? Good. Um, so I'm quite was quite struck by the um, the, the line the, the you were mentioning about stretching the body to its limits legacy, and I feel like there is a kind of commonality between the three presentations that we saw in terms of how what we mean by stretching the body to the limits. Because obviously in the very sort of kind of um, dominant narrative of technology, it's being able to think better and faster, and your brain being somewhere else, and you being able to to have a better diet and sleep better and that kind of thing. Um, all with the aid of technology, and technology being this brilliant, wonderful thing that's going to help us do it. But often, as, as you mentioned, Sarah, it's a very male dream. And the idea of these technologies being able so that the man can go off and do these things, but the woman still has to take care of things like the shopping. Um, and I'm quite struck, Simone, by you mentioning about not wanting to almost like emulate the current s sort of standard of what we have now and what um, we think things should look like, but actually testing, using digital um, environments as a way to... Um, push those limits of the body, what it can be, and, and subvert it and change it and not try to kind of 
emulate it in it is kind of specific a form as we've come to know it. And I kind of wanted to know if any of you had, had any further comments about that sort of dream of how technology is supposed to stretch your body and the idea of the body to the limits. I'll start if you want. Um, it just it just made me think of because uh, I, I do I do spend a lot of time looking at these promotional videos. I make no excuse for that really. I think they're incredibly potent forms of storytelling, and they make the average publisher really jealous. The kind of you know exposure they get. Um, I'm not the average publisher. I have very very small outputs. Um, but but yeah, I mean you know there's the, there's the Google Glass one, isn't there? Where um, Sergey gets up on the stage with his um, Tom Cruise Minority Report T-shirt on. Um, and his muscles, and he's, he's, he's showing a kind of video in the background of someone skydiving with their Google glasses on, and it's, cause it's, a, it's a bloke. And then, and then it kind of switches to, you know, immediately to, to the Janets and Jennifers, and they are always called Janet and Jennifer. I just don't know why they are. But, they, but they, you know, there is something that kind of fundamentally normative about the gendering of it as well. And, you know, it's always something to mess with. I, I mean, it, it, it kind of completely struck me when I first started seeing it, and then I saw, saw it everywhere. You know, they're always doing the shopping. You know, there's, there's, there's Jennifer buying her blouses and, and Microsoft's Janet baking focaccia bread in the kitchen and her smart kitchen, which could talk to her. But that's actually what she's doing. You know, and it's just kind of, what? You know, what, what is going on here? And, you know, I, I think I just don't see the reasons of being purely technological, right? I, 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 I wonder if the standardization issue, and I think that's fascinating, um, you know, and I know about the Bertie on stuff and how, you know, how, how that's all kind of... It worked its way through a whole sequence of surveillance-based technologies. Um, but I wonder how much of standardization has to do with the limits of computation. But for me, for, for sure, there, there is the limit to politics that's, that's kind of framing the whole thing. I think for me, I'm like a lot of the work that I do within contemporary art and working with artists that are predominantly female identifying and queer and also people of color is, is um, looking at the online platform, uh, you know, the format of internet as material in specific as a means of experimenting with avatars. Um, and when I say avatar, I think, you know, I'm using it in a, a way that obviously references the technological, but also asks of us to see online performativity as an art form, um, and that within that art form, um, there's a lot of potential for uh, artists to be contributing to a discussion about how to expand on selves um, and selfdom. Um, so the artists that I spoke about in the presentation, E. Jane and Manuel and Shane, are all making really incredible work in this vein. Um, you know, kind of looking to represent themselves online, but also as well to like use that as a site of experimentation that then can be um, brought out into the world at large. And I think it does quite a lot in terms of um, setting new standards for us and experimenting with, bo with what bodies can do, um, quite literally, and and not seeing it as a sort of um, you know, fantasy space, but rather something that is very concrete and can be materialized and actualized. Yeah, I mean, I, I was only going to say, you know, I, I sort of completely agree. I think um, looking at technology, I mean, for me, that happens because I think uh, making stuff is still quite sort of important to try to, to react, but it's also really schizophrenic because I end up, um, you know, sort of trying to, to challenge something and then recreating it as well. Um, but, but I think it, it very much for me is, is sort of looking at like prostheses of biases that already existed. So, you know, even specifically with, with the sort of the recent Stanford study of um, facial recognition, trying to figure out if someone, um, someone's sexuality and orientation, you know, like the, the human didn't necessarily develop much further, of course, the technology did, but that doesn't mean that its application adds anything new to the discussion or furthers any way of us um, thinking ab about, you know, how you could look at, at someone. Like, why is that even necessary that you would categorize someone um, by their sexuality? And so I think sometimes it, it, it seems a little bit as if, um, you know, technology sort of averts, averts um, not these discussions, but um, almost clouds the fact that that still hasn't furthered at all, that, you know, there are just different tools um, of doing the same thing over and over. Yeah. I wonder too if there isn't something kind of, you know, as well as the sort of the, the tech and the politics of it, something kind of profoundly mythical, you know, so like a, you you imagine the Frankenstein body, the cut ups and the reassign, you know, just the, you know, it's one of my favorite. It's my favorite novel actually, um, you know, and it, and of course it's it's it's, it's uh, connotations are entirely biblical, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I've created this longing to create through techno science through culture, 
and then this utter horror <laughs> that you did it. You know, what is that kind of thing? And this, it, it, this I, I think we have kind of culturally, socially, politically, the same kind of responses over and over and over again. I'm getting old. And it just freaking me out. I think like, how the, many times do I read the same thing? You know. I think that the that reason why is that is uncanny as an experience is because, of course, that that body is not legible in a certain mm -hmm. way, right? And for me, I, I think I often spend a lot of time, especially when I was looking at your presentation, I was really um, intrigued considering this notion of surveillance that you brought into the discussion, um, how one can maintain a connection to being illegible um, so as to you know, prevent or uh, disrupt that experience of being constantly surveyed. Mm -hmm. And you know, the image that you had on the screen of this head measure, you know, I, I think is like a very poignant and important image, um, you know, even though it was shown very briefly, because of course it makes very real the fact that these technologies are incredibly, there's so much bias that's built into them, mm -hmm. and also they are operating within histories that are very racialized and gendered. Mm -hmm. um, and so how they are applied in terms of reading selves, um, I think is something that is useful to be considering and thinking about um, when we look at artworks um, and how those things can be deployed out in the world. Mm -hmm. No, certainly. Um, I mean, I always remember the kind of the end of, of Frankenstein, which is also one of my favourite books as well. And the idea of the accursed creator and oh, you created me, but I can only be anything but a mon I can only be a monster. Mm. You've only created with me the capacity to be a monster, um, which is a whole different sort of politic when you think about the, the, the subjects that you're all kind of confronting. So I'm going to now um, open it up to the audience. If we could raise the house lights, house lights. Um, any questions? I'm, I, I hope there are. Hi. Um, oh, hi. <laughs> oh. Um, I have a question for Legacy. Um, your presentation was amazing, thanks. And um, in it, you mentioned uh, there are different ways of conceiving of um, bodies, and I wonder what it was that led you to lend your focus to specifically a cosmic body, um, and how that's maybe a corrective for what's been criticised as a kind of um, like Eurocentric male conception of a kind of humanist kind of ideal of a universal body. Yeah, I mean, the, the quotes that were used in the presentation actually are really meaningful to me on a, a personal front because, um, you know, James Baldwin wrote Giovanni's Room, I think in like 1954, somewhere around there. Um, someone can look it up. Um, but, um, you know, if you look at that, and then of course you're, you're looking at Anaïs Duplan, who's a really incredible poet and writes a lot about the body as it relates to the internet. Um, highly recommend her book that came out um, fairly recently. But, um, I think you can see that obviously there's you know, an ongoing discussion within literature, within culture, about how to end the body, right? And um, you know, within Giovanni's room, of course, it's a quite a strange example of that because you know James Baldwin manifests this character and embodies a character who is a white male um, who is existing out in the world and is able to kind of move with some relative sense of freedom um, in this Parisian space, um, but yet is still in a, you know a metaphorical and quite literal way locked in a room um, and then you know considering as well this notion of a cosmic body how to expand beyond these rooms if you will um, that for me has become a really useful um, idea because it's about looking at you know a wider spectrum and within contemporary art of course I think that a lot of artists are, are making use of um, you know digital materials as in with VR and AR um, and as well you know just presenting themselves online, making themselves visible in ways that are very intentional and deliberate, um, that otherwise perhaps in previous iterations of technology might have rendered them invisible or marginalized them further. So there is something that within that, within my own research and my own practice where I'm really curious to figure out, you know, what is that intersection? Because of course there is a contradiction there. Like it's very confusing that, you know, online as bodies, you know, myself as a, a queer woman of color, right? Like you can be out in, in the world at large and that there is so much representation of, of that you know, within a very particular contemporary art setting. Um, if you're looking at artists like the ones that I mentioned in the presentation, right? So they set a model for myself about you know, how to expand, take up space, and, and um, you know, build those rooms. Um, but then you know, if you think about, of course, through the lens of what Sarah is talking about, you know, there is the ongoing problem right, of these technologies that are failing us in many ways, or that are presenting a real um, problematic notion of what you know, our daily life is and how we're supposed to be interacting with that, these different technologies. So um, I think that that in itself is a complicated 
position, you know, to be standing in between and negotiating. Um, but for me, it makes it worth the while to keep pushing those boundaries and to consider, of course, what artists can do in, in making that, um, you know, more consistent in our day to day um, as items to strive towards and to build upon. Any more questions? Any more hands? Ah, here at the back with the mustard jumper on. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the talks. I was personally wondering, uh, Simone, when you talked about those categorization of f like facial categorization, do you know initially why they were created? Was it only for criminality reasons or is there any other reason why these classific classifications were made? You mean the one by Berdia? Uh, yeah, or the one by NATO? For me, it's not really clear oh, okay, why. Okay, the Caesar database. Yeah, yeah. I mean that one was. Um, uh, well, each partner had their own reason to to take part. Um, the main reason was that the this is something that the uh, U.S. Army um, does almost generational. So every thirty to forty years. Um, um, they do the sort of study of body measurements to um, be able to create uniforms, um, design the, the cockpits of their um, um, airplanes, etc. And this is also the same reason why um, the Automotive Corporation of the US also was part of it. Um, so you'd also use simulation. Um, there's a tool by Siemens called Jack, um, which, is, which is also sort of this anthropometric um, puppet, essentially, that is based on those databases. Um, so one is, it's called Ansor and Caesar, um, that deliver body measurements to this puppet to then be able to um, either design, you know, again, insides of cars, um, assembly line setups, digital factories, etc. So it's, it's a very, um, yeah, I mean, the use case seems very much to be able to, to produce products that, that would um, fit a wide array of people. So that's, I think, the sort of idea of the average, right? That you try to, to yeah, fit to as many as, as, as possible. And in that sense, it's also a very um, commercial um, reason why you would want to do it, because you'd want to like, have your market be um, yeah, as, as widely accessible as possible. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. Any more hands? Oh, we do. Thank you. That was all completely great. Um, the question I had, I guess, for all of you to finish with was um, there seemed to be a collective theme from you all about the way that technology can reinscribe and lay down very normative structures, uh, constraining structures, particularly around gender. And I'm wondering, when you're talking about eligibility and glitching um, and hi hiding, perhaps, do you see this as a possibility of stepping outside of those structures or something that has to be done within and working through these structures as well? Yes, I mean, I think that the, uh, very much so. I My hope with this idea of glitching and, and the research that I've been doing is, uh, is figuring out a way to um, build on a language that you know, within a realm of technology has been considered quite pejorative, right? Like an error is something that's not good. But I, I think that within a social system, when the social system is the error, um, being a correction to that can also be an, an awesome mistake um, and, you know, something that is worth embracing. Um, and so pushing beyond that, it's not about ex existing slowly, like, you know, within an uh, exclusive uh, space of being so, uh, solely online, um, you know, or via these technologies exclusively, but rather that it's about strengthening the loop. Um, and acknowledging that this idea of what is real actually is very much that's the, the part of the problem um, that you know in creating these dichotomies they they, they mirror um, the same sort of dichotomies that we use to strengthen um, and reify these really archetypal quite violent um, heteronormative binaries um, so how do we break away from that code and um, part of that is about you know experimenting with what these technologies can do, but also acknowledging where they fail. And in that failure, I think, being triggered to step outside into the world um, and to continue to act um, with a sense of responsibility and making space for all bodies. Yeah. I mean, I <laughs> That's a good answer. I, mean, I, I, I think failure and, and glitch are really a, a key part of the 
process, but I think the 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 fix for me, uh, it, it's not uh, it's not autonomous. It's arduous, actually. Um, and you know, outside of the the frameworks that we that we put ourselves in around fiction, science fiction, which has of course a lot of the uh, similar kinds of scenarios. That, that get us out, and it's why it gets deferred to quite a lot, I think, by theorists, more perhaps by theorists than by artists. Um, you know, they, they, they're not going to, you know, outside of that, I think that the changes that we need to make uh, are very, very, very slow and very, very difficult. And I think that la the labor of that, I think, is something that we, that we need to bring forward when we're talking more and more about autonomous systems. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's something I've sort of had in my own practice as well, where um, before this work, um, I was mainly interested in this clash of, of um, the failure of technology in reading a body. So this is also where the Hillary Clinton lookalike comes from, where I was really interested in that sort of, you know, accidentally already fooling facial recognition, but, you know, sort of almost like a slapstick joke, like, well, yeah, this is how stupid it is, it can't even recognize... Um, someone that accidentally also looks like someone, you know, so, sort of something that's already encoded in, in human beings that, of course, you can look like someone else. Um, but I've sort of, I mean, at the end of the day, it also, it left me a little bit empty, I think, that, which is why I stepped into this work, like actually trying to read the code and try to figure out, you know, okay, this is one way of looking at it. And I think the failure of technology um, holds a lot of potential as well. But at the same time, um, it's also difficult to, to keep up with the progress of technology at that. So doing facial recognition work before and trying to sort of, you know, hide an obfuscation in the many. So to realize, you know, the, the, the way you come up with um, sort of ways of fooling it, technology keeps on getting better. Suddenly it's not reading the face, it's actually reading the blood vessels um, sort of underneath your skin, etc. So I think, so for me, actually the practice of, of trying to sort of uncover what's within the software and really literally trying to read the code, um, which isn't even just a code in software, right? It actually becomes like, again, also something that's been repeated a bunch of times now, but like a social um, code has become much more valuable and like what to do with that then yeah i don't know i don't think it's just, it's, it's like in a collective effort i think at the end of the day um but really trying to understand what we're working with rather than sort of trying to 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 just um perpetuate great great this is all great um but it's, it's, it's the joy of again of curating your own festival is that you get to invite brilliant people. We had a brilliant panel earlier and we have done for the past few days actually and it's been wonderful. Um, but it does mean, mean my brain is somewhat partially yogurt because it's just like swimming with these ideas. But um, thank you so much Legacy, Simone and Sarah. It was an absolute pleasure. Um, and if you could give them a round of applause, that'd be wonderful. Um, we have a um, screening.